This is Greg Troutwine with Marine Technology TV. We're here at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton at the Ocean Business 2017. We're here with Professor Ed Hill, the Executive Director of the National Oceanography Center. And Professor Hill, first and foremost, thanks for taking the time to join us here. Uh, you're welcome, Greg, and it's a great pleasure to be here. But if you could just give an overview of your activities here to kick things off, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So the National Oceanography Center is uh, part of uh, the Natural Environment Research Council, which is the main body that funds environmental science, including oceanography in, in the UK. Uh, we are a national facility. We undertake uh, research in large-scale oceanography, everything from physics and climate through to ocean biology through to seafloor processes with a big uh, program in marine technology uh, development and innovation. We also run major national infrastructure like our global class uh, research ships, the Discovery and mm -hmm. James Cook, as well as the National uh, Oceanographic Data Center. So we're uh, an asset here to do great science, but also to enable the whole of the UK science community uh, based in universities to be able to do uh, big ocean science as well. Well, obviously, the ocean is very near and dear to your heart. We could talk for hours, I assume, on environmental change and just the importance of exploring our oceans. But from your aspect, when you look at the oceans today, why the oceans? Yeah. So uh, there are really three big challenges uh, facing uh, society. Mm -hmm. um, by 2050, there are going to be 9 billion people uh, living on Earth. And 70% uh, of them will be living uh, within 70 kilometers of the coast in low-lying coastal regions and megacities around the world. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, really sparks three big issues. Firstly, how are we going to feed 9 billion people? Uh, where are we going to get clean supplies of energy to power our economies? Where are we going to get the strategic minerals that we need in future and uh, the new medicines that we're going to need to uh, uh, combat uh, disease? Um, we're looking to the ocean uh, for the solution to many of those questions. Um, and we need to be able to exploit those resources in a sustainable way, such that the ocean's future productive capacity and the ability to continue to supply resources is as good tomorrow as it, as it is today. So that's the first big challenge. Mm -hmm. The second one is most of those 9 billion people are going to be living in low-lying coastal regions and vulnerable to uh, coastal flooding, which is the biggest uh, natural disaster mm -hmm. risk that faces most uh, people across the world um, mm -hmm. and from extreme uh, uh, weather events that uh, come from the sea, like hurricanes and typhoons. Mm -hmm. Here in Britain, our biggest natural disaster risk is storm surge flooding, and our capital city is uh, very low-lying and very vulnerable to uh, coastal mm -hmm. flooding. And then the final challenge is, how do we make sense of uh, a lot of really big changes that are happening across the globe, whether that be the change in variability in our weather and climate, right through to there is a major loss of biodiversity happening across the planet, mm -hmm. both on land, but it's happening in the ocean. And um, the ocean is deeply implicated in all these changes. 98% of all living space on Earth, it's 70% of the uh, covering the planet. And so if we want to make sense of any of this mm -hmm. uh, global change, we've got, to, we've got to make sense of the ocean. And despite all of this, and its importance. Uh, we know more about the surface of the moon and Mars and even the planet Pluto, it has to be said, than we do about our own, own ocean. So there's a lot to find out. How long have you been involved in this industry and what got you interested in yeah. the oceans to begin with? Yeah. Well, uh, I started off like many oceanographers uh, in a completely different discipline. I'm, uh, I'm an applied mathematician. That's how I started off. Uh, I was always interested in the sea. I was brought up by the sea when I was a, a kid um, and then got interested in fluid dynamics and then realized the ocean was a great place uh, to do fluid dynamics. Okay. So that's how I personally got into the, into the, into the science. And uh, uh, then I've been uh, running research institutes for ne nearly 20 years, uh, okay. first a small institution and then had the privilege to be in charge of the, the, the UK's National Oceanography Centre, which is absolutely fantastic. Every job, every position has its challenges. What do you consider to be your greatest challenge in keeping the activities of the National Oceanography Centre moving forward? Yeah. Well, like uh, every oceanographic institution in the world, 
uh, everyone will tell you they don't have enough money, they don't have enough resources to do it. And that's true of us all. And uh, uh, we, we, Because the, the challenges in front of us are just so enormous. That, that means we're continually looking for resources. And here at the National Oceanography Centre, we're certainly looking to diversify uh, the, the opportunities uh, to maintain the capability that you need to do really big science. And there are half a dozen institutes across the world with this scale and capability. Of, of doing it, so that's a, that's a big issue. The ways of going about that, though, are, are common because we've got huge opportunities, so I'm not uh, really terrified by this challenge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, the OECD uh, produced a report in 2016 mm -hmm. uh, that forecast the ocean economy would grow mm -hmm. from $1.5 trillion a year to $3 trillion a year mm -hmm. by 2030. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a doubling, and it's certainly much higher growth rate than the average uh, growth uh, rate of the global economy. So there's huge opportunities in the ocean. Uh, we're moving ever deeper into the ocean to uh, meet these uh, challenges. And so, actually, there's a much wider range of customers uh, and users interested in, in the science that we're doing and the technologies that we're, we're generating. So I think that's the first challenge, is to... Um, engage in the right way uh, with, with those people. The other big challenge that we have is no one institute, no one country can do this science on their own. So cooperation, international cooperation is absolutely the name of the game. And so um, we are working with, with big institutes across the world to try to uh, understand how we can share out the load of uh, measuring uh, the ocean to understand its, its processes and, and change. And so those are the two big things that we're, we're, okay. we're really working on. Uh, we talk in our pages regularly about big data. Gargantuan amount of data that is being collected and then making that data into actionable data or usable information. Can you just kind of put in perspective the challenge that you see of getting the data and more importantly, using putting that data to usable uh, effect? Yeah, well, of course, historically, uh, oceanography's problem is it didn't have enough data. Uh, the ocean are uh, grossly un undersampled in space and time. But really, uh, since 2000, with the advent of the Argo float program, we've been on a journey of being able to make more measurements uh, in the ocean. Uh, last year, I think we completed the millionth Argo float profile. Um, so that gives you, uh, well, so more data has been collected in the last 10 years than in our whole history of oceanography uh, be beforehand. So that presents uh, new challenges and, and new opportunities. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I think that is, is really important is to recognize that we actually are on the cusp of a technological revolution in being able to measure the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, from the traditional method, which has been to go out in research ships for a series of one-off expeditions and maybe to leave some instrumentation in the sea, mm -hmm. which you may or may not get back, mm -hmm. through to trying to maintain a much more continuous presence in the ocean uh, with much more global coverage through autonomous robotic uh, submersibles and to move from the things that we've been able to measure quite well in the ocean like its temperature and salinity uh, the physical properties through to the biogeochemical and some of the uh, ecological properties of the ocean and that's where we're heading uh, continuous presence um, and a much more diverse range of, uh, of parameters that we're measuring. We're on the journey of that, but that is absolutely uh, transformative technologies are making that happen. And I'm mm -hmm. convinced that in 10 and certainly 20 years' time, the way in which we are collecting data from the ocean will be mm -hmm. very, very different from today. And we will have a vast volume of data, which then brings me to the challenge that you've identified is is how to manage that data and and to turn it into uh, actionable products we're going to have to um be much more uh, adept at handling real-time data and actually the sensors that we develop uh need to have the data management problem it uh, recognized at the outset so that they're actually collecting the metadata that goes with it mm. and stamping it and so that the whole data management problem yeah. is starting with the the design of the sensor uh, that, that, that we're dealing with. Then the issue is about um, 
making sure that we can put this data together from across the world's ocean. And increasingly, the problems that we're dealing with are not just about the ocean itself. Mm -hmm. It's the way it couples with the atmosphere, with uh, water coming off from the land. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make data much more interoperable okay. uh, across the whole of the Earth, Earth system. And this is not about taking all this data and putting it in one massive data center where yeah. we can pick it out. It's about being able to uh, access and discover and search this data using uh, semantic web type technologies mm -hmm. um, such mm -hmm. that we can suck out these data from the yeah. disparate places where it's held and then uh, fuse them together. Um, and then there's the issue of how, how is that data actually turned into things that people want to use, which is very much about engaging and finding common languages um, mm -hmm. with the users, whether they be in the business sector or in government, mm -hmm. as to what is really needed so that we can turn those raw data into really usable products. The real secret of this is actually not about pushing data out. Uh, it's about enabling the relevant users to access, to be able to discover and pull out the, da the data they want. And that's a different kind of a approach because many of the products that are needed uh, will, will come from the users themselves, yeah. provided that they can have access yeah. to the data in ways that are searchable, which they uh, are not at the moment in, okay. in ways that they need, they need to be. Okay. So it's, a, it's, a, it's turning this whole yeah. data challenge on its head in, in, yeah. in many ways. Yeah. You have a lot of interesting technology. You have a lot of interesting studies, um, and you, having been in this in this field, know that studies are one thing, but then taking that uh, that technology to market, uh, finding places where it can become a product, it can become a system, it can become a business, uh, is perhaps one of the greatest challenges that you face. So, from the standpoint of the National Oceanography Center, what are you doing? to help these scientists, these technologists, take their ideas uh, so that they can be out in the world in, in various means uh, to quote unquote make a difference. Uh, absolutely right, Greg. You've, uh, this is uh, really important is to turn great science into great uh, business innovation, uh, to create jobs and just create great businesses um, that can work if effectively in the, in the ocean. Um, we have been working very, very hard at this in the uh, National Oceanography Center. Um, the area of technology that we're particularly uh, interested in and have great capability in is autonomous and robotic systems, both in terms of the vehicles. Um, we started in this game about 20, 25 years ago, uh, making deep sea submersibles that were all autonomous, and we've done some great science with it. Um, but Many of those sciences uh, and, and advances now have practical applications in, in much more uh, mundane but very uh, useful uh, applications. For example, we discovered the world's deepest, hottest hydrothermal vents uh, by sniffing out their plumes uh, with chemical sensors on an autonomous vehicle. The same technology has got applications for sniffing out precursor chemicals from carbon capture and storage sites sub subsea. Um, some of the technologies uh, that we use for exploring underneath Antarctic ice shelves where you are completely uh, remote from the ship and you need a truly autonomous capability are now uh, being used in things like pipeline, pipeline survey. So what we've been doing here is um, trying to bring small technology companies uh, to work alongside us um, who are interested in developing these systems and the micro sensors that you put aboard them, um, as well as bring in uh, companies who are not so interested in developing the technology but want to shape the way that it evolves mm -hmm. and are interested in using it. Mm -hmm. Primarily oil and gas uh, majors mm -hmm. and defense companies at the moment. So uh, 18 months ago, we opened here at Southampton a Marine Robotics Innovation Center. Mm -hmm. And we're working now with about 20 companies, mm -hmm. uh, large ones, who are users and small uh, companies who are working alongside us um, in a number of projects to develop uh, innovative uh, autonomous systems. And um, that's been very successful. It's been growing. We've got a lot of projects going uh, on in there. Uh, and that's uh, a real high 
hub for bringing uh, all of this together, academics, the users, uh, technology companies, as well as engaging with some of the public regulators of uh, how this technology will be used in the ocean, because there are quite a lot of uh, legal issues associated with it as well. So, um, so we're, we're trying to play this role as a very much a hub to be a bridge in this innovation mm. landscape, and uh, we've certainly grown our engagement with small companies, uh, many of which are here at Ocean Business, uh, uh, actually taking some of those products um, to global markets uh, right now. So... Um, it's a success story, but we believe there's a lot, lot more to be done in this space, and we're very, very excited about it. I can only imagine that a center of this magnitude requires continual investment uh, to keep up looking at the National Oceanography Center and looking at the, the investment in it going forward. What are your priorities? Uh, where, where, where are you investing today and tomorrow? Yeah. The areas that we're investing in are, is, is very much in the technology space because uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that will enable us to work with businesses. Uh, it's a way of diversifying our income and it's a way of demonstrating to government, who is the primary funder of uh, oceanographic sciences, that it's worth putting public money into uh, oceanographic sciences because uh, we do make a real difference uh, to businesses. Uh, and that's, that's important. It's also, uh, we're investing in the technologies because this is going to transform the science. The things that we need to be doing sci scientifically are going to be transformed uh, by new technologies. And all the greatest discoveries in oceanography have been enabled by new technologies. So we're putting a huge emphasis on this. But our big challenge is to try to understand the way in which the Earth system functions, the mm. way in which the ocean is changing, mm. and its variability, which is causing em enormous challenges and opportunities to human society. Mm. Uh, the carbon cycle, the way ecosystems are changing, and the way in which the, 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 the ocean processes are affecting uh, uh, sea level and, and weather. That's the science that's motivating us, yeah. but it's the technology that's enabling it, and that's where we're putting our uh, big focus right now. Yeah, Professor Hill, I, I truly appreciate your time, your insight, uh, and again, hope you have a nice stay here at the show. Great. Right. Well, great talking to you, Greg, and I much appreciate it. Okay. This is Greg Troutwine with Marine Technology TV.